let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, our, our hearts within us uh, grow tired sometimes and our, our spirits uh, faint and, and wane. And we turn to you, Lord, and ask for revival and strengthening. We ask, Lord, for the wisdom that transforms our hearts from meek and faint into courageous and that turns our minds from the things of this world to the matters of your glory and your honor and immortality through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Father in heaven, as we consider human laws, let it be always with an eye towards serving you and bringing your love and your mercy and your faithfulness to a clearer and clearer vision in the works of man in the world. Bless us this semester, Lord, and bless us in our worship so we can draw near to you and be revived and encouraged and drawn to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's rise together and worship God. Uh, this semester we will study together the uh, elements of the law of God as it relates to the categories in which we study law. And uh, this is a, a, a way of engaging uh, God's law that isn't uh, driven by necessarily what the scriptures teach in the sense that our categories of law, things like criminal law versus civil law or constitutional law versus civil law, uh, these sorts of categories, contract, property, torts, are not necessarily the categories of scripture. Sometimes I think they are, uh, and sometimes I think we'll, we'll see that they're they're not, or they, they, they have some resemblance to something, but there's something else going on in the Bible. Well, we approach the scripture this way because these are topics that are important to us. Uh, th as a matter of fact, as professional lawyers, these are the ways that we have been taught and trained, or you are currently undergoing training, uh, to think about the law as we approach it generally in the world today. And that makes it appropriate to approach the scriptures and, and ask, well, what does the Bible uh, say about these things? And sometimes it's going to say, uh, this is a well-founded concept. This is re clearly related to God's scripture. Sometimes it's going to say, uh, well, our idea or our application of these categories is off a little bit. And sometimes it, the Bible may teach us that God's way of dividing up the law is, is different. And uh, we want uh, to find these things because for a lot of us, uh, we've never read the law. We, we've never looked at the law of God and uh, read it as a text that, that matters to us. Um, probably for, for most of the people in this room, I'm, I'm sorry to say uh, that you have, have never studied the law of God with the intensity that you apply to almost every subject that you studied in high school, to mathematics or biology or to physics or to chemistry or to history. Uh, you've never approached it really as a, a subject for study that you feel is important to you. And my, my uh, hope is, because God teaches us really clearly that the, the laws of God uh, are important. They didn't used to be important. Uh, they're important now. Uh, they, they, they don't apply in the same way that they once did to Israel in, in the kingdom of, of Israel, uh, but they retain their importance as a revelation of an ideal, as a revelation of, of God's standard. Uh, men make up what we call utopias. We, we come up with ideas about what a, a perfect kingdom would be like. And uh, men invent these things according to their own principles. And then we spend time studying these things. And a, a lot of our political ideas today come from thinking about utopias. Uh, maybe Karl Marx's future utopia. What would it be like? if we could, we could live in a, a land without property and without government uh, through a, a revolutionary dialectical evolution of, of uh, society, uh, what would that be like? And people study this and are enthused by it. Uh, and, uh, or people imagine, uh, what was this utopia like when man lived without government in a, a hypothetical state of nature? 
What would it be like to live in a land before any governments had ever formed when, when people were first meeting on the plains uh, of, of the world stage and thinking about how they should live together? And in the recent history of man, we have drawn far much more from our imaginings about hypothetical societies that appeal to us today than we do looking at the authentic revelation that God has given us of an order that is as good as you can make human society. And you can limit that in all sorts of ways. You can say limited to that time and that place. That's fine. But we pay no attention to that order, and we pay lots of attention to our own imaginings uh, about what man would be like in the primitive condition, about what man could be like at some far-flung uh, future time. We pay much more attention to our own imaginings than we do to the concrete revelation that God has given us of how an ideal society should be composed according to its laws. So I, I appeal to you, I have, I have a, this burden for you. Um, I think most people today spend far more time drenching themselves, maybe even drowning themselves, in the corrupt imaginings of man, of these utopias. Utopia means no place. These corrupt utopian imaginings of man about what we could achieve. And it turns us away from what God has revealed to us. And so this semester, I, I hope to take our present interest in things like property, contracts, what's that other great subject? Torts, criminal law, constitutional law, uh, uh, evidence law, uh, different categories that we're familiar with from our legal studies. And, and uh, at one level, just shame you. Do you know as much about what the Bible teaches about these subjects as you do about what U.S. law or Korean law or Locke's theory of a hypothetical state of nature or Karl Marx's theory of property? Do you know as much about what the Bible is telling you, and I should say about what God is telling you, is an, an ideal measure for human conduct in this world, the sinful world, because the the laws of Israel were not made for perfect people. They're made for people like us who needed correction, who murdered, who committed adultery, who stole, who killed kings, who did terrible things. It was made for them. But it is an ideal. God says, look, the nations are going are to come around and they're going to see this law. And those who hear about it are going to go, this is wise stuff. Because it's God's way. So I, I ask you just to, to, to think about this. Uh, have you ever uh, meditated on God's law? Have you ever studied it? Have you ever studied the, the way that God organizes his people in, in Israel? And if you say, I, I haven't because that's, that's irrelevant uh, to me, here are the words of, of Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be referring to some of the scriptures in the uh, introduction to the materials I provided you. I'm on page one right now here in the, in the first paragraph. Christ says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called Great in the kingdom of heaven. My guess is you haven't been taught a lot about these commands. And there's, there's a lot for the church to teach about these commands. 
Uh, a big question for the, the church is, and you can read Paul talking about this a lot in books uh, throughout the, 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 the epistles in the New Testament, is uh, what does it mean to follow the law differently through the Spirit in Jesus Christ? It's a big question. And these are fundamental questions of the gospel. These are the things you should be learning in church. Um, but I'll tell you this. Um, I don't know of any, any denomination, any theological school. Uh, maybe there are a few uh, extreme uh, groups out there that say, uh, because of the change that was wrought by Jesus Christ on, on the cross, we should no longer treat the law as part of the Bible. I know of no Christian uh, denomination that, that says, well, we're going to take the first five books called the law, the Torah, the Pentateuch, and we're going to eject them from the Bible. There was a heretic named Marcion who did that. The Gnostics did that. But no one who calls themselves Christian does that. Because we continue to believe that studying the law of God is part of the authentic revelation. Why? Well, partially because Jesus says right here. These commandments are, are being fulfilled in me. They, they continue to have meaning and importance and purpose that's revealed in Jesus Christ. The, the, the meaning of the law has changed. We're no longer under the law. But the value of the law as part of scriptures, the, the times over and over and over and again in the scriptures where it says, meditate on my law, meditate on my precepts, meditate on my commandments. When Jesus says, don't think I'm doing away with these commandments, that I'm blotting them out of the book, that I'm erasing them, that I'm, 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 I'm taking these away as something that give wisdom. No, he, he, he says uh, to, the, to the contrary, that these will remain until heaven and earth disappear. Last time I checked, heaven and earth were still here. Is that right? You can peek out the window and see, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. So this semester, what we want to do is take our, our interest in subjects like uh, property and contracts and torts and criminal law and, and constitutional law and, and evidence, uh, laws about the family, laws about, about liberty. Uh, we want to take those and we want to begin our meditation on the word of God, on the law in particular, as lawyers, by taking our existing interests and checking them, taking our existing beliefs and checking them against the, the scriptures. Now, the, the law of, of uh, the Bible, when it refers to the law, as I note here in the second paragraph, the law can mean something a, a, a little broader than we tend to think of it. So, for example, here in, in John 15, Jesus refers to the law and he's referring to a psalm. He, he, he puts the psalms under the category of law. And that's because the word that's being translated there, law, is the Hebrew word Torah. And, and Torah can refer a little more broadly than our, our laws do to things which teach us. There are some good words for this in English that are kind of that, are, that you may not be familiar with, like precept. A precept is a kind of measure that's given from one person to another. It may not be a law as we speak of it, uh, but we can speak of the precepts of law. The law has precepts. The law's commands are forms of precepts. They're legal commands. But uh, the, the Torah, the idea of it, is, is broader than what we're going to focus on this semester. We're going to focus on a particular aspect of the Torah. So again, the Torah is broader. It includes the Psalms. And if you've read through the, the, what's called the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, you'll have noted another really important element of them, which is stories, histories. The, 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 the law begins with a story, the story of the creation of the world, right? an account of the creation of the world. We're going to focus on a portion of the Torah uh, the portion that Jesus was talking about in the passage I, I read to you from uh, Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be focusing on the commandments of the Torah. 
We're, we're not going to read the, the Torah as a whole. We're going to focus on the commandments of the Torah. And the reason for that is it's easy. It, it is a good beginning part because we are used to law which presents itself as commands, as, as rules directing people. And lo and behold, when we look in the Torah, a significant, not overwhelming, not even the majority of it, maybe the plurality of it, maybe the largest part, I don't know. But a significant part of it consists of commands. So it's easy to compare what we study every day with the commands in the Bible. We have a command about not murdering. Well, if you look in the, the, the Torah, in the, in the law, there's a command about not murdering. And we can compare those commands. And we can see that they have similarities. And we can say, yay, our command is like God's command. That's very interesting. That, that, that heartens me. And we can see that our commands about not murdering have differences from God's command in the Torah. And we can say, oh, I wonder if that's okay. Maybe it's bad. Maybe it's good. Maybe uh, conditions have changed either in Christ or conditions have changed from the state of Israel to ours. So maybe that's good. Okay? Just because there's a difference, we haven't yet got to the question of, of whether our law should be identical to the law of the Israelites. The answer is, in my opinion, it shouldn't be. Um, but if there's a difference, a possibility is that it's a difference because we have gone off the rails somehow. So, for example, if we say it's okay to murder people, uh, most people would recognize uh, the law of God teaches us very clearly that both then and now you shouldn't run around murdering people. And if you have a law that says uh, some people can murder other people, well, that's, you're fighting with God now. Amen? I hope that's not controversial. So we're going to focus on a portion of the Torah. The Torah is large. It contains stories. It contains songs. Uh, it contains uh, different elements. There's, there's the poetic, there's the prosaic. Um, we're going to focus on the part which is most similar to what we study every day, the commandments. Is, is that okay to do? It wouldn't be okay forever in your life. If you really want to understand the commandments of God, you should read them in the context of the, the entirety of the law. Why? Because that's the way God's law gives it to you. But as a way in, as a starting point for meditating on God's law, it's a good starting point because you should be interested in them. I mean, one way of thinking about being a lawyer is you have an interest in the way that commands are structured. You have an interest in the way commands from an authority to a people are structured and given and interpreted and applied. And that's the portion of the Torah that we'll be, we'll be studying. Uh, the other thing is, uh, Paul tells us in particular that the, the commandments that were given to the people of, of Israel were given as a limitation on them. Uh, the word he uses sometimes is a pedagogue, who was the, the servant that would take a young person around before they became an adult. If you, were, if you were growing up in a wealthy family in the Mediterranean in uh, Jesus' day, uh, you would be assigned a, a, a servant, a slave, and his job was to uh, keep you out of trouble, to help in your upbringing. Uh, good pedagogues gave their charges, their wards, good advice, but they protected them from physical danger. They got them to school. They they provided them with good practical advice about their, their affairs. And uh, Paul makes it clear that the, the law of God works that way for us. Th these commands, these, uh, these commands that were given to Israel to guard them and shape them and, and lead them to, to Christ, um, they bear the stamp of Jesus Christ. They... They are meant to prepare a people for Jesus Christ. And in, in fact, uh, Paul says, they, they continue to be that. Christ continues to be the goal of the law. 
This is the reverse of what Jesus was saying. Jesus is saying, I'm here to fulfill the law. What the law is, is aiming at can be realized through me. And there's lots to say about what does he mean by that. And Paul talks a long time about that. But the, the reverse way of looking at it is, look, if you're reading about the law, you're reading about something which is pointing to Jesus Christ. How? Well, it points to Jesus Christ because it shows you what it means to live righteously. And Jesus lived righteously in a way that none of us can. not uh, It points us to Jesus Christ because Jesus died, according to the scriptures, to save us from our sin. And these laws teach us about our sin. They teach us that we're, we're sinful. Uh, we're, we're so sinful that we, we find ourselves in a state where we can do no good. But in our regeneration in Jesus Christ, in the transformation that happens to us in Jesus Christ, suddenly our soul awakens and we want to aim for good. This is the third way. The law points us to the good. For those who desire it, for those who want it, the law helps us to find it. So we, we work with the commandments because the, the commandments are, are easy for us to relate to and because they are charged and signed, because they are pointers that were meant to, to protect and guide people to Jesus Christ and continue still to do so. I'm on top of page two now. I mean, look, here, here it is very, very simply, okay? We're a Christian law school. There are two elements to that. Law, which you're familiar with, <laughs> Hopefully, at this point, if you if you haven't if you haven't encountered law here yet, don't raise your hand. But uh, come talk to me; I'll help you out. You know the the law a bit of law school, um, and you know the Christ bit of law school, uh, Christian law school. You know about Jesus Christ. You hear Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed in your churches. You know about Jesus Christ. What a, law, a Christian law school should do is be putting these things together. Now, the law is not Christ, so we can't put them together by saying they're the same thing. You, you don't come to Jesus Christ by putting yourself under the law. To the contrary. So how do we put them together? That's our question. What is the relationship between the laws that we study and Jesus Christ? What is that relationship? I mean, possibilities are they're the exact same thing. What it means to be a Christian is to follow the Mosaic law. That's not true. And it's so not true that Jesus and the, the apostles spent a lot of time throughout the Bible saying, that's not true, that's not true, that's not what the kingdom of God is about. The other possibility is there's no relationship at all. That's not true either. We just read the, the passage from, from Matthew. Uh, Christ says, I'm here to fulfill the law. I'm not here to annihilate it. It's all going to stand until the heavens and the earth disappears. It's, it's not out of the picture yet. Our relationship to it is transformed because we have the fulfillment of the law. Uh, we're no longer under the law. We have grace and truth now. There is a relationship. What is the relationship? Well, just the few scriptures we've seen, it's some kind of relationship of fulfillment. It's the goal. It's, it, there's a, a relationship we have to the law that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ that puts us in a relationship to that law. Uh, there's a chart, uh, a little graphic, I suppose, on, on page one that I hope will make this, this clearer to you. So there's a circle. Circle's a good shape, right? It's a perfect shape. And this is what the circle looks like. At the top, there's Jesus. And if you are, have been saved in Jesus Christ, if you've experienced redemption, if you've experienced uh, his love, his divinity, his resurrection, if you know newness in Jesus Christ, if you understand that he is the king of all, then you, you want to go to him. You want to be with him because he is the, the source of your strength and your life and your glory and your honor and everything. Amen? Everything in my life I want to give and direct to him because in him I find all the good things of my life. Well, I've, now I've spent, uh, you know, 
a year or two years, three years studying law. And I've got this big bundle of law knowledge in my mind. But do I know how to give that to him? I, I know uh, what the U.S. standards of contract law or tort law are. Do, do I know in what ways those things can find fulfillment? What are they aiming to? Well, look at this chart. On, on the left side, we have the laws of Israel, the commandments. So if we have a commandment in the law of Israel about property, we know something about it. It's, it's aiming at Jesus Christ. The, the laws of property, the laws of contract, the criminal law, the constitutional law, the laws of, of freedom, uh, the laws of finance, all these kinds of things were given to point to Christ, to protect so that you could be led to Christ. They, they have their goal in Christ. They have their fulfillment in Christ. They have a, a wisdom which is related to what is accomplished in Christ. So we know the relationship in theory between Jesus and the commandments that God has given the people. We know that because the Bible tells us what it is. Uh, we know it because we know that God is love. We know that his love is revealed in Jesus Christ who died for us when we were yet sinners. This is how much he he loves us, and you don't love anyone enough to die for him hardly. But Jesus died for us when we were in rebellion and sin against him. That's love. That's the revelation of love. And we know furthermore, Jesus says, you want to know what the law is all about? It's about love. That's the essence. That's the core. Okay? There, there's a relationship between the revelation of love in Jesus Christ and what the law is about. And if you look at it from the law side, the, the law leads us to Jesus Christ. It's always been teaching us about love and the love of God and guiding us back to God. Was it sufficient in itself? Absolutely not. That's why it needed Jesus to come and fulfill it. Amen? Well, on, on that side, we know at a general level uh, what the relationships are between the laws of God and Jesus. They, they are, are ones of like a pointer finger. They're pointing. They're, they're like walls that channel people. They, they convey people to, to Jesus Christ. They prepare people for Jesus Christ. We know, uh, theoretically, at a general level, what it is. What we're going to do this course a lot of the time is we're just going to say, okay, if we know that about them, how do we look at a particular command uh, to punish murderers how does that lead us to Jesus Christ? Well, let's look at a particular set of commands, the laws of property. How does that lead us to Jesus Christ? We've been told that these, these commands work on the whole to lead and guide people to Jesus Christ. Well, now let's look at particular commands and ask how they do. We, we know in general that the law is about love. How is property law about love? Christ says the, the laws are about love. Okay. How is property law about love? What does the scripture tell us? There, there's a relationship between the laws in the Old Testament and Jesus. And we need to go from having a, a general overview knowledge to having a particular knowledge. Why is that interesting to us? Well, because sometimes, and now we can look over on, on the right hand of the chart, we, we find similar laws in our own civil legal systems. So I find property law in the laws of Israel, and then I go to modern Korean law, I find property laws. I find punishments for murder in the uh, law of Moses. I look at modern Korean law, I find punishments for murder. I, I find contract, I find contract. It actually goes on quite a bit. There's so many similarities. We'll explore those this semester. If we understand if, if we're taught in the, the law of Moses how this points to God, and we will be because th this is a lot of what the law of Moses does is not only to say, do this, don't do this. It says, do this, don't do this because of something about God. The law of Moses teaches us a theology about God. It, it somewhat mysteriously oftentimes says, we do these things because in doing them, we relate to God. And in Jesus Christ, we can understand even better what that means. 
And you need to understand that. Because if you're practicing property law, and the Scriptures teach you that in doing that, you are pointing people to Jesus Christ, hallelujah! If you're, if you're practicing contract law, and the Scriptures teach you that in practicing contract law, you're actually pointing people to Jesus Christ, hallelujah! Praise God! My, my work in the law is not just about making myself money, which is nice. It's not just about uh, having a job and keeping busy, which is a good idea, right? All that kind of stuff. What I'm doing is part of God's ministry in the world to draw the nations to himself by standards of civil justice. So if we, if we find a teaching in the Bible that, that enforcing such and such a law uh, leads people to Christ, well, then our riddle is solved, right? Uh, we, we have now both sides of the circle in a way, right? We, we know that the, the uh, laws of Moses lead people to Jesus Christ, and we have a question. I've helpfully noted that question with a question mark in my chart. We, we have a clear sense of the relationship between the laws of Moses and Jesus Christ, fulfillment, preparation for. But what is the relationship between Jesus Christ and what we do every day as lawyers? Is it the same? Is it different? Is it sometimes the same, sometimes different? What is it? Well, that's the task of Christian meditation on the law. The the task of Christian meditation on the law is, is not to read about the law of God and then to keep it in a bubble far away from the rest of your thoughts. The, the reason we're told to meditate on the law of God is because it is part of his full counsel for us to live in this world. Jesus didn't say, okay, I've come, throw away the first five books of the Bible. You take your, your like in uh, Dead Poet Society, take the, the first five books of your Bible and rip, rip them off. It's an awful thing to think about. He said no such thing. Rather, when he was teaching the gospel... He would refer to the law, and he would show how the true interpretation of the law was there, and people were blinded from it because they they preferred their their legalism and their sense of strength and flesh to relying on the salvation that they had in God. Not that that meant that suddenly murder was okay, or adultery was okay, or that theft was okay. It didn't mean that these things no longer had a measure for us and a guidance for us. It meant that our entire relationship to the law had changed. But the law is still wisdom. And you need to figure out what that wisdom is. You don't need me to do that. My job is to show you the relationships. On the left-hand side, to show you how God's law relates to drawing people to Jesus Christ. And then what I can do, I can't necessarily answer that question mark for you, but the other part of our meditation is, if you look at the, there's another connection with the laws of the modern state. We can compare the laws of Israel with the modern state. And this is what I said before. What do you find? Well, sometimes you find agreement. Sometimes you find really strong disagreement. Sometimes you find similarities. And sometimes you find fundamental different conceptual organizations of the law. We can can begin to think in this way about what our modern legal systems are doing, not by saying, well, the modern legal systems have to be exactly the same as as the Mosaic law. Uh, Well, that's silly because uh, certain portions of the law are totally fulfilled in Christ, like the sacrificial system. Some portions of the law relate to the particular place of Israel. Make this city a city of refuge. Well, we don't have a, we can't do that because we're not there, right? This is why the best uh, teachers on on this point and the scriptures themselves say it's the the equity of the law. It's the the, the ratio of the law. It's it's the principle of the law that is retained as a guide for us. But when we see a sharp discontinuity between the law of God and the law of men, we think back to all the prophets— who spoke to Israel and to those who spoke to foreign nations and condemned them, condemned them in the strongest terms. 
because they had violated the law of God. When we find a strong dissimilarity between our laws and the laws of God, we have reason for concern. Because God's holy prophets have again and again condemned not just Israel, but the nations of the world for their violation of God's standards. So when I see that we're doing something radically different from the law of God, I'm thinking, well, one of two things is going on here. Either uh, this is a situation where the, the, the equity of the law, the principle of the law, allows for significant differences, in which case we're okay. Uh, or we're in big trouble because we have, we have diverted ourselves from the, the will of God. And that's not all we can do in meditating and, and, and relating. Because as I've said, uh, the law of God does not only teach uh, the, the command in the sense of saying, do this or don't do that. It also gives reasons. Uh, we, we, have, we have big general reasons that help us in general, like when we learn that the law is all about love, that the law teaches us to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. That's a big clue. If you look at any particular provision of the law and you think, what's the purpose of this? Here's an answer. It's, it's teaching you to love God and love your neighbor. Okay, that's a starting point. But, but the law of God gets much more particular. It tells us how this is loving our neighbor that you should do something because it will do some good thing for your neighbor. Do this because it will do some good thing for your neighbor. Do this because this is part of the way that we, uh, right now, keep ourselves fed, keep ourselves healthy, keep ourselves protected. Uh, there, There are things which appeal to the most concrete kinds of love. This is the sense in which Paul will say, you know, how can you say you love somebody if you see them, they're starving, and you don't give them some bread? You say you love them, you give them some bread. Right? Sometimes the, the law speaks to us this way. And we have those same purposes with the Mosaic Law. So if God says a, a law has its purpose in part in the social conditions it creates because they they constitute love for your neighbor, that's very useful for us because that helps us understand how these provisions move forward in their purposes to this day. So if that command would no longer accomplish that social good, then maybe we shouldn't do it. If we think this is always going to be true, that stopping people from murdering people uh, is a really good thing to do, well then the, the purpose carries forward. But there's a final purpose which is shown in the law of God. Sometimes the law of God, as we'll see, says do this so that you can enjoy this immediate good. But other times the reason that the law of God gives for doing something relates to the ultimate good, God. It says that that in doing this, we imitate God. We respond to God. We please God. We approach God. This is something that if we do it, it bears not just a structure of helping this person or that person, but it is itself a way of communicating with God, communing with God, being with God, seeing God, understanding God. All of this I I would sum up by saying... um, I'm going to pick up, uh, the, I'm going to skip over the summary of last semester. If you were here last semester, you might want to read it anyway. Maybe you didn't pay attention. Maybe you fell asleep once or twice. You pick up, learn a little something. Um, but uh, I'm over on page three, why we need to meditate on, on God's law. The basic way that the scriptures talk about uh, meditating on God's law isn't like a Buddhistic meditation, a, a kind of deadening of the of neocortex so we stop uh, speaking to our, ourselves or being aware of ourselves. It, it isn't a, an, an effort to engage in sort of a, a heightened mental consciousness. Those are all interesting things to do uh, with your brain. I think they're kind of, kind of dangerous myself, um, but... Uh, Uh, That's not my subject right now. My subject is, what does the Bible mean by meditating on God's law? 
And the, the most basic sense that we can derive from scriptures is a big part of meditating on God's law is reading it and thinking about it and making it real, personal, applied to yourself. It, it, we, when we read uh, David meditating in the Psalms, he, he doesn't stop talking. He's talking. In fact, sometimes it sounds like he's talking out loud, which is okay. You don't let other people hear you doing that. You know, they, they think you're, something's wrong with you, but uh, he's talking out loud. He's, he's talking to God. He's, he's talking to himself. He's speaking to his own soul. He's, he's thinking about the things that God has taught him, and then he's applying it to his own life, sometimes to his own shame, sometimes as part of his own repentance, sometimes because it's stirring him up to go out and do great deeds, sometimes because it's stirring him up to endure through the difficulties that God needs him to endure. This is what meditating on God's law means, most basically. It, it means be familiar with God's law and think about how it applies to your life. Now, there are two ways you can do that. I mean, one way for you to do is read God's law and be converted in your heart. This is the most significant thing you can do with God's law. Is, is if, you, if you have not repented of your sin, the law will teach you your sinfulness. And it, it will draw you to repentance. But there's another thing that the, the law can, can do. And, and this is, I would put this as the objective sense of what the law can do. Not what it's doing for me, but what it's doing for me as a Christian lawyer who's concerned about things in the world. You should apply the law to yourself. That's first. But the law is also used to be compared with the ways of nations. Throughout the scriptures, the, the ways of God as realized in the law are compared with the ways of nations favorably. The, that's the good way, and these are the corrupt ways. That's one of the aspects we're doing. That's all I'm saying. A basic way to meditate on the law for you as a Christian lawyer. If you are a lawyer who's interested in the laws of the world, you're interested enough to come here and study for three years. I guess you're pretty interested. You're interested enough, okay? If you're interested in that, a good way to convert your interest about human laws into an interest about God is to say, hey, God has told me what an ideal kingdom in this world looks like. And when he did that, he talked about categories that are similar to the categories that I'm interested in. I'm interested in contracts. I'm interested in torts, torts more than contracts, naturally, but I'm interested. Well, well, now I'm interested in what God has to say about it. How can you not be interested in that? If you're interested in human law, you should be interested in divine law. Well, how do you, how do you reflect that interest? How do you bring those two things in relationship to them? It's pretty easy because God does this through the prophets all the time. He'll go, hey, here's my law. You guys are breaking it. Or, here's my law. You guys are keeping it. Way to go. Thumbs up. Well, we can, we can do that. And, and furthermore, sometimes God teaches us the principles of his law. Here's my purpose in this law. Here's what I want to do. I want to provide for this good in human society. Or here's what I want to do. This purpose is not only to provide you with good in human society. This is true of all God's law, I believe. It draws you up to me in a particular way. Well, that's really interesting. I mean, one answer to the question I posed to you, what is the relationship of Jesus to the laws of modern society, is it's the same as the laws of Israel. That the laws of modern society function better or worse in the same mode as the laws of Israel. Israel's laws do it as good as you can do. They point to Jesus Christ in the best way possible. They're, they're the best. But maybe the laws of all societies do the same sort of thing. And they do it better insofar as they're more like the laws of Israel in their essential purpose, and worse as they get more unjust. But you have to decide that. I mean, some people believe and I think these Christians are really wrong, 
that the laws of men have, have nothing to do with the spiritual purposes of God. That, that God took a cleaver and he put a, a, a clean division between what he's doing in the kingdom of God and what he's doing in the kingdom of man. And he doesn't teach anything uh, to his people that has any relevance in the kingdom of man. People teach that. I, I just think that's a lie. It's, like, it's as silly as saying that what uh, you learn in Jesus Christ has nothing to teach you about your marriage. Well, Paul says that's not true. That the, the, the marriage of a man and a woman is actually uh, the law of that, the character of that, is actually a symbol pointing us to Jesus Christ. That the roles of the man and woman in marriage are the roles of Christ and the church. Marriage, it, which is a very practical institution. Marriage is great. I recommend it to you if you're called to it. I recommend marriage. Uh, it's great. And I'm, uh, I'm, my, my wife is away from me right now, and I'm, I'm hungry and I'm sad. And, you know, the house is falling apart around me, and everything's terrible, okay? There, there are, there, and she, she's, she's worse. She's more miserable. Right, honey? No. She, she's more miserable than I. There are immediate goods that come from marriage. But those immediate goods are not ends in themselves. They also relate us to Jesus Christ at the same time. We become living symbols of the relationship between Christ and his church. Amen? You get it? Well, is, is marriage then have nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is, is there no guidance we gain from how marriage should be? By, by understanding who Jesus Christ is? I, I think that's wrong. Of course, you can make an error. You can say it should be exactly the same. Well, that's false too. That's not what Paul says. But, but your job, your fundamental meditation, the final point of your meditation is, is here. We, we take baby steps at first. What is the law of God? What does it say? I, my guess is most of you don't know. Um, because you've never been taught. Because it's somewhat daunting to study the law of God. Just like it's daunting to study the law of the United States or the law of Korea or the law of Spain, you need a teacher. You know how I know that? Because I'm in a law school where that's all we do with our time is teach people law. It's hard, right? You need to study. Uh, you in particular as lawyers who concern yourselves, who have an interest in law, need to use your interests. You need to use every part of your life to find delight and happiness in the Lord. Why would you deprive yourself? And, and you do that by taking your, your natural interests and following them through the word of God to what God has taught about those subjects. And what is he, what is he taught? Well, the end point of your meditation that begins with studying God's law and then proceeds to apply it to your own life by saying, hey, the standards that we follow in Korea or the standards I'm learning in U.S. law or the standards in international law agree or don't agree. That's an opening start. Very simple meditation. Am I living in ways that agree or disagree with this? And then a deeper meditation. What does that mean? What, what is the purpose of God in this world and the purpose of God to draw us to him that, that stands behind this law? Is the difference something which is good? Is the difference something which is bad? I, I know the overall relationship of Israel's laws to Jesus. Preparation, guidance, fulfillment. What is the overall purpose of the laws that I have? Do they have nothing to do with serving Jesus Christ? Do they have everything to do with serving Jesus Christ? Do they have something to do with Jesus Christ if I approach them and use them spiritually? If, if I approach the laws of this world and I approach them uh, as someone guided by the wisdom of the law of God and most importantly living in the spirit of Jesus Christ, can I, can I use those laws then as an advocate to point people to Jesus Christ? What's your answer? Well, probably right now you don't have an answer, which is sensible because you haven't started meditating on it, is my guess. But, but my hope is that this will be the beginning of a lifetime of meditation. 
The, the law school in, in, in Israel, you know how long it lasted? Law school? Your whole life. You, you meditate on the law of God your whole life. Okay? Because it's inexhaustibly rich. Because you're meditating on love. Because the, the, unlike the U.S. Code, the, the, the law of Moses is, is rich. You can study it your whole life. You, you, can, you can find in it guidance for your whole life. Okay? That doesn't mean you don't read any other part of the Bible. Of course you read other parts of the Bible. But this is one that's pretty interesting to you. Because this is what you're already interested in. And so it can lead you in and out. So uh, to conclude, if you look at the syllabus on, on page 5, you can see uh, the way that we'll approach this uh, semester. Uh, next week, and an announcement about uh, next week, uh, we have a really wonderful opportunity next week. Uh, we've been invited to have a, a, a lunch with the... Uh, the fellow who's uh, in the head of the embassy before the ambassador uh, comes. And we hope to talk with them about some important issues. You, you guys are always going up to the embassy for visas and different things. So introduce the, the law school to him. But the only time he has available is on Friday. So Christianity and Law next week will be on Wednesday during the forum time from 1.15 to 2.15. Okay? And then Friday you can discuss with your, your family groups. Uh, your, your professors, what you're going to do that day, whether you, whether you want to meet some other time, whether you want to meet on, on Friday, be a great time to get together for a little longer lunch, dinner, picnic, something uh, like that if you want to do that. But just uh, as a reminder, next week, Wednesday, we'll be meeting at 1.15 for the Christianity and Law Lecture, okay? And pray for, pray for our meeting uh, with, with, the, uh, with the embassy officials. But we'll start with property, and then we'll move to uh, obligations, uh, two kinds, contracts and damages. And then we'll have two weeks on criminal law. Um, and then on the seventh week, the first of two projects that you'll have for your grade in the class will be due. So this kind of marks a, a division in the, the way we'll be approaching things in the semester. And what I want from you is very simple. I, I want you to write me a well-reasoned question. Reflecting on, on what we've, we've done, I want you to write me a, a well-reasoned question, setting out something that we've talked about, about a, a page double-spaced in, in length, uh, but, but something which you think would advance our discussion in the class, something that I've been confusing about, something that I'm wrong about, um, I'll give you a bonus point if you show me that I'm wrong about something. I'll give you a candy bar, okay? <laughs> Unless it's a trivial thing. No de minimis errors, okay? Substantial errors, okay? Um, I, show me that I'm wrong about something. Um, but ask a question because the, the class on the 7th will be a, a summary class all composed of addressing your questions uh, the things that you think are obscure or, or hard to understand, I'll address those all uh, on the 7th. So that will, those questions will be due October 12th. That gives me uh, four days to read over the questions and compose responses to them. Okay? And I'll tell you how to, basically you'll email them to the office so I won't know who you are. You'll use your, your numbers. Uh, then we'll consider evidence, constitutional law, family law, freedom, laws of liberty, the protection of, of liberty. And the, the last thing we'll do is, is talk about uh, exceptions uh, to the ne necessity of obeying the law, uh, times of obedience and disobedience. And then the 14th uh, so class will be th the same as the 7th. I'll be responding to your questions, either about the whole semester or, or those things. And so you'll need to turn in your questions on November 29th, uh, the, the last Monday, in order to give me time to, to do it. And these questions, they should be little mini essays about what you understand and what you don't understand, uh, framing your own uh, questions about how to improve your, your meditation on the law. And as we get closer to you, to do them, uh, I'll tell you more about, about what I want to see in them. 
Uh, look, that's the end of, of our introduction today, uh, except to say this. I, I have a, a, you know, a, a burden. I, I, I feel a weight uh, this semester because uh, it paralyzes me with fear that you would go out and practice law and you would have no idea what the, the law of God says. It, it seems awful to me. Because in, in my own life, knowing the law of God and seeing the ways that the, the laws of modern contract law or property law are fulfilling the purposes of God to provide good for humanity now and also to point to Jesus Christ makes me love practicing law. It, it, it animates my practice of law. It, it animates my advocacy. It makes me want to advocate for people so they have access to the goods God wants to give them and so they have access to a clear understanding of who God is. That's why I want to be an advocate. And the thought of you going off with no knowledge of God's law and practicing law solely as a slave to the, the, the power of man without any understanding of what you're doing or any comfort or encouragement, uh, that's too grim a notion for me. So I, 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 we're all busy. But this, is, this may be the, the moment in your life. This may be the, the, the chance that you have, the only chance, for you to learn what God's law has to say about these things. So I'm going to be doing my best for you. But, but I need you to study what I've put in front of you. I've, collect, I've made it easy for you. I've chewed it up for you. I've, I've pulled all these commandments out of their parts, and I've done my best to make it easy for you to go for, through them. And then in the lecture... I'll, I'll try to help you digest them and put them in relationship to things that will activate them for me. But, but do it. Give it a chance. Listen to God. Because the stakes are high. The stakes of disobedience, of course, are, are, are high. But, but the stakes of missing something that God wants to give you in this life so that you understand what His love is doing in the world, don't pass that up. Okay? Let's pray. Our Lord in heaven, we thank you for your law, and we thank you for the opportunity to meditate on your law this semester. I bless our meditations, Lord. Uh, we know, Lord, that, that we only uh, can hear your words uh, through the power of your Spirit. So we humble ourselves before you, Lord, and we ask that you'll read with us and you'll guide us and that Jesus Christ will be our wisdom as we read your law. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.